So we're like, we have a great solid family and a foundation, but money can excel your kids to be able to get into business, get into multifamily, single family, all these things. They watch me as I go through my homes. Like I've made a lot of money with single family. Like it's a great starting point. You're listening to The Azria Show. If you're looking for quality real estate investing information that you can trust, you've found it. Stay tuned and join the tens of thousands of members that have already benefited from Azria, your home for education, market information, support, and networking opportunities that will advance your real estate investing career. What's up, Azria Show? This is Mike Del Pre, Executive Director of The Azria Show. Uh, and today you can see him flying solo. Marcus Maloney is out on a business trip. So we have a special guest here today, um, Sophia Willits, right? Yes. Real estate investor, creator of Learning Apartments, founder of Grace CRE Multifamily Brokerage. You're going to share a lot of multifamily with us today. Yes. Which is very exciting because traditionally everyone gets started in single family and their goal is multifamily. A hundred percent. Right. So maybe we could talk about just skipping single family, right? You could probably show us that. Yeah, or, no. no. I mean, single, f- single family is a great place to start. And okay. it can get you into multifamily very easily that way. Get your feet wet. Yeah. So so I'm going to go over her bio. Uh, as a professional real estate broker, she's done over 1,000 transactions in the past 11 years, creating 900 million plus ROIs for her clients. Just make it a billion. <laughs> Just make it a billion. <laughs> yeah, probably. Over the, over the last three years, now investing in her own deals and creating three to 500% returns on her multifamily acquisitions. Since 90% of multifamily trades off market with a with a broker, which your your brokerage, yes. this inspires Sophia to help others know how to get off market multifamily properties on their own. Very exciting. Yeah. And I love the word off market. Yeah, right? I love those off market deals. So start there. Yeah. What, what's an off market multifamily deal? Well, a lot of people may not know this, but 90% of all our transactions, just like you said, are actually traded off market. If you want to get a hold of an institutional broker, Mm -hmm. most of the time they won't give you the time or day or even like, especially if you're a newbie, right? You're like, hi, my name is so-and-so and (laughs) and I have like a hundred million dollars and like the broker is going to like pretty much hang up on you or scream at you, especially if you're a new syndicator, wholesaler, trying to like get a broker to send an off market transaction. Mm-hmm. Why the hell would a, a institutional broker send you a 20 to $100 million deal if you've never even closed one? Yeah, It's very difficult. So the these brokerages, like what they'll do is they're not NAR members. Okay. So that means that they don't have to be part of the National Association of Realtors. So that means that they don't have to follow code of ethics and they do not have to co-broke and they will only represent one side. Hmm. So if you work with a commercial broker that's not an NAR member, their interest is only for the seller. So say if you call like on a listing on like LoopNet, Craxi, any of those type and you're like, hey, I like, I wanna take advantage of this opportunity and you can show the broker like, hey, like I can maybe close on this. Well, they're gonna, give you like an offering Mirandin that's going to be a performa. They're going to pull out comps that are not necessarily relevant. They're going to pull out rental comps that are not necessarily mm-hmm. relevant. And they're going to come up with a performa that is so far from the actuals that a lot of investors like, oh, like I can get this type of return or this type of cap rate off this deal. And what happens is then like that newer investor syndication group, goes off what the broker says Mm -hmm. and then once you get in with them then they'll start sending you some off-market deals after you prove they can already close but they've also put people in really bad situations for the sellers and actually the buyers so typically what happens is the the commercial broker has cherry-picked buyers okay and they can get the seller to sell it for a lot less per door without putting it on the market. So they are not even advertised, okay? So a yeah. lot of the listings that you actually see, they're actually, 90% of them will have an exclusive listing agreement, but you'll never see it online. It will right. only be to their synergy of buyers, their REITs, their institutions that they want to sell directly to. Wow. So, and even these owners that have these buildings, they're not calling the mom and pop investors. Oh no, they'll yeah. go directly always to a broker most of the time. 
Got and it. then they'll do a 1031 and exchange into their next portfolio. So how does a little guy get in? How does it? So let's go there. You said, so I said, maybe you'll show us how to just get into multifamily. But you said, no, maybe start in single family. So which I think is great because that resonates with us here at Ezria. Mostly uh-huh. single family, under 20 units, right? But everyone always does want to go bigger. So how did you start? Yeah. Real estate investor. So my dad actually was a real estate investor. He's from Austria. He was raised in the World War II era. And so like he was actually adopted out in the war. So he didn't have like a lot of good opportunities, but mm-hmm. definitely struggled with school, like had to work really hard for everything that he had. So only making it into the fifth grade and then getting like working for the butcher shop or working in the streets of Austria or all these like construction jobs. He wanted something more for himself. Mm-hmm. So he moved here when he was 21. Cool. And he didn't speak English. He only spoke German. But he was able to get a job working for a German mechanic. And they liked his hustle so much, they sent him to car school and oh, learned wow. how to become a mechanic. But that's for a season, right? Mm-hmm. So when I when I say, like, everything's for a season, you know, that can take a toll on your body, right? So in, when he moved here from 21, working in the car industry and then, you know, not wanting to be commissioned anymore, he ended up buying his own car lot here in Phoenix. Oh, wow. But his body took a toll. So pretty Mm -hmm. much like broke his like back. He had multiple back surgeries and couldn't really work on cars anymore. So what he did was he sold his apart. I'm sorry. He sold his car lot Mm -hmm. and bought apartments at 36 and pretty much semi-retired. Wow. So I was raised with an investor. um, So that was here in Phoenix. Yeah. And I, you know, we had a single family home like Mm -hmm. back in the day. I think when we bought our house and my dad bought the house in the 80s with um, my mom, they were married and they. I think he bought his apartments when I was three, but you know, like that was like 11% rate. So like, and he bought his building for like five to 10,000 a unit. Oh, that's amazing. And like, I mean, he was charging a hundred to $150 rents. Wow. But my dad was a total slumlord. He mm-hmm. did everything himself. Like he would go dumpster diving. I would hide in the car because <laughs> I didn't want to be seen in the car that my dad's a dumpster diver. Um, he used to threaten me if I wasn't being good to go live there with the tenants. So he's uh, like, I'm gonna, I'll go live there. <laughs> so I was like, no. He, he talks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's kind of funny. But, That's funny. But he was, it was a hard upbringing. We didn't have AC in our house here in Arizona. That was a luxury. Mm, didn't wow. have AC in our cars. That was a luxury. I really thought we were poor growing up. Wow. Yeah, it was so, kind of crazy. So like, so I think about my son, I'm always like, come to the office let's go see a house you know he's like eh, whatever dad so i still push it on him yeah Hopefully one day it'll come around so what were you growing up were you just like i hate that building or did you, yeah i or, hated it yeah, i was yeah. like why the hell do we have this thing and yeah. but it was our income you know and i you know my mom just worked part-time for benefits and stuff mm-hmm. but my dad was financially free wow you know amazing. what i mean which is incredible But, you know, like I hustled. I had a lot of different jobs because my parents didn't give me any like Mm -hmm. allowance or anything. So I started working when I was 12 and I started I started doing sales door to door for candy like at 14. And, you know, like I hustled. Yeah. And I actually bought my first house when I was 19 and I house hacked it. Before it was called house hacking. Yeah. So (laughs) I rented out every single room, including my laundry room. So night, okay. So nineteen. What inspired you to do that? Where like, why did you want to buy a house? Why didn't you? Just uh, I was eighteen rent? because like my parents were investors. I never. So okay, they pressed that upon you as well. Yeah, they okay. never pushed me to buy a house, but I was like, I ain't ready. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no opportunity in that, and I've, I never saw my parents rent anything, so I was just led by example and yep. got my first place, and I was cash flowing. You know. Love it. Yeah, and then what I did was still on that house. Oh no! <laughs> okay. I, I I ended up like getting a. What happened was like when I was like 21, I got a really good sales job at Lazy Boy. Okay. And um, this is like now starting to become the mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I first initially got the house, I was making like $35,000. And the, and that time, it was a lot of money. Yeah. And then when I got my sales job at Lazy Boy, I was making like 65000 a year. I was making 7000 a year. I thought it was a baller. Wow. So, I was just like, yo. Like so when, I'm 41 now. So like. Why not like a. Uh, customer service or something what what made you go to sales na- i've always yeah. been really good in sales it's just natural just, just yeah it. i okay. started at 14 i was mm-hmm. like i gotta make some money yeah like so i've always pretty much been like commission jobs or like odds and end jobs there but i wanted to start buying real estate mm-hmm. you know like i sold my house bought another house and i'm like i'm gonna buy all this real estate and my papa at the time mm-hmm. was like i'm gonna sell my apartments in the mid like 2006 okay He's like, Sophia. Before, so that was right before the crash. Yeah. Okay. 
He's like, don't buy anything. You're going to lose everything. I'm like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm making all this money. Like all my yeah. f- all my sales associates that what I worked with were all buying real estate. We're buying it, things through countrywide. And, mm. you know, like we're like, we're going to be millionaires, blah, blah, blah. It's never going to end. Yeah. <laughs> so my dad sold. Smart. And then I lost everything in 07. So wow. I had three foreclosures, a bankruptcy, a million dollars in debt at 24. And now I'm like a newlywed too. I had to get a loan modification on my house mm-hmm. and just everything was pretty much going to shit. Wow. And I lost my sales job at Lazy Boy because who was buying furniture at that time now? Yeah, nobody. Wow. Yeah. So so what did your dad know? My dad recognized Why did he, know? he recognized the pattern. Yeah. And you know, we never really had the rent growth even in the mid 2000s mm-hmm. and here in Arizona. So, you know, like that was my learning lesson that costed me, but I'd never stop loving real estate. Well, so, no, okay, jump in. Like the power there. So your dad gave you the advice. So what I'm saying is the power of community and like mentors and being around people doing it. Right? Because a lot of people, when they get into single family or investing, they're like the cousin says, or the family members say, you're crazy. It's a scam. You, you get where I'm coming from. Yeah. So people that are not in our world and they're new to it, they're nervous to get in because you have your goal. You want to say, what was it, 9% of people don't actually end up buying their first multi family. Yeah, you know what? So, it's crazy because like people get into these mentorship groups. They'll spend anywhere from ten to 45000 to $60,000 in these um, multifamily groups, but only less than 9% of the students actually get a deal. So if you, so meaning, you your dad was there sometimes we learn the hard way I, yeah I still yeah do. and they didn't really have like a lot of those they had some i think mentorship groups but not like they do today especially but the power was knowing someone in the business yeah they, they, they have those ideas and, and he those was like a little it was a little apartment owner but yeah. like he knew what he was doing yeah that's huge yeah. being around people that know what they're doing yeah will help you become more successful so, so i mean like he was selling his apartments now at seventy five thousand a unit and he saw the market he saw this window of opportunity yeah so obviously i lost everything i went to i went back to actually beauty school i finished okay. up my hair license and i wanted to you know i got pregnant during the recession and you know we i wanted to stay home part-time and be a mom also, my, my wife was a hairstylist and we owned a hair salon as well oh yeah that's yeah. awesome yeah, yeah i built a, actually a salon in my garage and mm-hmm but like I wasn't making money. I mean, people couldn't even afford to get a haircut in 08. Yeah. People were struggling. They were, they were, they were struggling. Wow. So, so you got through the, but I would say having that trade, that skill probably helped you get weather the storm at some level. Yeah. It, it, you know, like I loved what I did, but I was really struggling because we were putting groceries on credit cards and we were living like this for now six years. And I'm like, this has to stop. Yeah. When, is, when am I, I'm like, I'll never get out of this race. So now I have my second baby. My daughter's two and a half. My son's five months. And I was looking down at my pay stub because I was working at the salons and mm. the malls too. And I'm like, I have $343 to my retirement. Mm. What am I going to do? I'm like, I can't keep living this way. So what I did was I told my ex-husband, I'm like, I need to go back into sales. And he's like, it's not the right time. You haven't given salon enough time i'm like it's never gonna be the right time you just have to go in and i loved i still loved real estate even though like i made those mistakes Mm -hmm. i'm like i want to do it different this time i want to be a real estate agent okay and i was like oh you know now it's 2013 and i saw people are making like 65,000. and for me that was a dream coming from like when i first was doing in my early 20s and i'm like can i ever see that money again because the market was so down it was yeah, so what I did was I went full-time to real estate school, and my my broker that I ended up working for, he actually sent me a letter, mm-hmm. and would pass by it every single day. Like, it would just be on my table. And so I while had, you're at school, like, mm-hmm. the brokers were Yeah, and I had, 10, I had 10 brokerages that I was interviewing with. I actually thought I was going to sell Pretty Little Houses. Oh, cool. Yeah, so funny enough, I was like, I'm going to just go see him because, like, it's, this is a letter that's been sitting on my... Mm -hmm. table for the past month but long story short i actually worked for him when i was 17 and he fired me because i was a terrible receptionist because i kept he kept on Mm. catching me play games at his (laughs) office but i went and saw him and i saw him in the parking lot he's i'm like hey he's like yeah i'm like i'm here for an interview he's like okay and he's looking at me he's like uh you look familiar i'm like oh gosh do i tell him he fired me i'm like you fired me and he's like are you sure i fired you i'm like yeah he did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that day. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm obviously like I'm 
16 years older now and yeah you know i'm ready to work and he told me i could sell multifamily, i could sell commercial i could sell industrial and houses i was like okay every other single residential brokerage i'm not allowed to do that so i felt more recession proof oh, okay so i hung my license with him and i'm like you know my dad owned apartments he's like i'm not saying that's going to be your niche well, it definitely was. I sold my first fourplex within the first 10 days. I sold 24 wow. buildings my first year, and I was able to retire my ex-husband, but he was my current husband at the time. Yeah. So. Wow, so that was your first year as uh -huh. a sales agent doing multifamily, and at that time, 2013, you're probably selling to Canada? Yeah, uh, yeah we're selling in Canada, yeah. um, definitely local investors, mm -hmm. a lot of people from California. The average sales price then was thirty five to like fifty a door. Yeah. I was selling four boxes for yeah. hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars and like it was just incredible, you know. So you got the bug. Oh yeah. Right. And then like I kept on doing really well, but it just showed like my current marriage was like really suffering. It was a very unhealthy relationship. So I just wanna encourage people like make like people say like money doesn't matter. Money can get you out of bad situations. Mm hmm. And it can actually create the freedom that you want to have to create the life you want to have. So I was so able to leave a bad marriage and actually meet my new husband. Mm -hmm. He's my partner now. He's our designated broker of our company, Grace, Great. Okay. CRE. And, you know, it's amazing, like, how much better my life is to actually have a parent that I can co-parent with. Like, my husband instantly stepped up, was an instant father for my kids within – like pretty much the first second day I met him, like he wanted to be there for my kids and you can't pay someone to do that. True. Either somebody wants to be a dad or they don't. Yeah. So definitely well, God was looking out for me for sure. So touch on that then, uh, spouse support. Like that's one big thing we do some uh, programs like a mini business plan, action plan for new investors. Yeah. And uh, the first thing I tell them, bring your spouse. They don't have to be in the business with you. But yeah, they have to be on board. Be on board, expose them to what you're doing yeah right that that's all and just be on the same page because if i've seen through the years just seen too many people just quit before they got ahead just because someone in the family didn't think it was the right thing to do yeah so how any tips on that you know your spouse can bring you down like i wanted to grow mm -hmm. and all i all i got was criticism like oh it constantly criticized oh you don't have to make a million dollars you don't have to do this but mm -hmm. like yet yeah, you wanted me to pay for everything like my my ex-husband decided to not work anymore he actually got his real estate license and then quit just wow. wanted to be a stay-at-home dad yeah but then tear me apart at home when i had to work mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way yeah. so like your spouse needs to be your best friend and your partner like if you guys are making money together and growing together that can be the most beautiful and like sexy thing in your guys' relationship. Like you guys are partners and yeah. you're growing together. You're, you know, you're, you're able to pay for these things for your family. You're able to create the life you want to have. What's not sexy is someone putting you down. Oh, you, you can't make it or Hey, like yeah, whatever. It's, not gonna, it's, work. it's not gonna work. So, you know, I feel like if you guys are on the same page and you guys can actually work and grow together, it's hard when you're married. To be able to do that but if you have your best friend doing it with you it's so much more fun i agree that's how how we've done it yeah it's yeah like you're, you'll be at a store or a restaurant and you're just like breaking down the business and like yeah you're always, or the phone rings in the middle like yeah. you get upset my, my just... husband handles like all the operations and the legal like he can read a contract he can write like an attorney he's amazing mm -hmm. but i'm really good at sales and yeah. so, like, we complement each other and we help and serve each other so much and our clients that way. There you go. That's perfect. Again, knowing your boundaries, either whether you're, the spouse is in it or not, they should understand what's going on, be supportive of it. Or if you're a team like yourself, know who do, who's good at what and everyone's staying in their lane. Right? Yeah, it's, it's good because, like, you know, you mentioned, like, your son, right? Mm -hmm. Like, my son, since I've been so successful with real estate, We've been able to invest into his hockey career. So uh, he, we uh, call it a youth career, that's not right? cheap. No, we're spending over $100,000 plus like he's going to Paris this summer. Travel, he's going to Canada. Equipment, yeah, he's going to Colorado. He just got accepted to play in Florida Alliance, which is a top seven team in like the country. Like all this costs a lot of money and time and sacrifice. But guess who's like 
taken that time to go make his youth career happen. That's my husband. Mm -hmm. It's us as a team, as a family. We're all in it together. We're bringing our families to go on these trips and events. But, you know, my like right now what I'm teaching my son is, hey, you get a million dollar contract, a twenty two million dollar contract to play for the NHL. They're going to take 40 to 50 percent of that away from you from Mm -hmm. taxes. So I'm actually teaching him how to get into apartments now. He's only 11. And I've actually started making him make phone calls to apartment owners at 10 years old. So if my son can get a yes, he's only 10. Okay. Yeah. Then anybody can. Does he like lower his voice on on the phone? No. (laughs) No. But you know, he's just, he's a kid. Good. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. I'm an entrepreneur. I would, I would, uh, I would literally take that call if a kid called me. I know. He's so sweet. And he's like, I'm an intern at Grace. Grace Equities. You should see the video on. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, but All he right. wanted fifteen hundred dollars shoes. I'm like, dude, get on the phones and hustle for it. He wanted off weights. Uh, yeah. I'm like, dude, you need to work for that. Like, he worked so hard on his youth career, but I ain't buying him fifteen hundred dollars shoes. I'm like, you can earn that. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you could earn that. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. and then you know my daughter, she's in the junior honor roll society, and then we have our little baby. Me and my husband have our little baby together. Mm-hmm. So we're like, cool. we have a great solid family and a foundation, but. Money can excel your kids to be able to get into business, get into multifamily, single family, all these things. They watch me as I go through my homes. Like I have made a lot of money with single family. Mm -hmm. Like it's a great starting point. So what have you done in single family? Have you invested in single? Like, so you were, you, st- you kicked off, was it 24 deals in your first year? Yeah. Uh, when did you start in investing? So good question. It wasn't until 2019. And okay. I was asked to go speak at, I don't know if you know this group, Renatus. Yeah. Help teach multifamily. Mm-hmm. I went with one of the teachers there and I started teaching for a night. And somebody brought me a wholesaler. He didn't have the deal. Nobody had the deal because I guess it got out, out of contract a couple of times because mm-hmm. he didn't know what they had. It was a sevenplex in Tempe. Okay. So I reached out to the direct, um, directly to the owner. And the owner was a home smart broker. Okay. So he didn't know where the comps were at. I just went based off the income approach Mm -hmm. and gave him the offer on that, non-refundable. I was going to just give the deal away for a 3% co-broke, but I was like, when is it going to be my turn? Mm -hmm. So after, you know, like closing on this deal, all I did was take photos and put it back on the market and I made 373,000 within like a couple weeks. All right. So let's back up a little bit on that deal. So one, you're networking, teaching again, right? Yeah. So... And then the opportunity comes on the table. You want to take it down. So you said there's two ways to income. You said to use it. You income approach. The, and what's the other one? What'd the you use? comp approach. Comp approach. Because it's a commercial one. Anything that's it. above five units mm-hmm. is considered to be commercial. Got it. And so now there's a lot there. So you just, did you take it down or did you I took it down. It? No, I took it down. Okay. And how'd you get the money? I put like what I had was after my divorce, I had a self-directed pension plan. Mm-hmm. So I'm able to reduce my income by investing into my own self-directed pension plan. Got it. So I took 90000 and the rest was on hard money. Mm-hmm. I took photos and I sold it within a few days and closed on it within a few weeks. Wow. After I closed that deal and like making that quick money, I was like, I got to do this shit again. So like I flipped like about 16 buildings in the past two and a half years and I was able to grow to $6 million. And that's all in Phoenix area? Yeah. Okay. So now, what? That's a big jump, three hundred forty thousand, right? It's like so, so. My my highest commission year of being just a broker mm-hmm. was seven hundred fifty thousand. Nice. Like, but that was me working my ass off, mm-hmm. doing like over a hundred transactions. And the unfortunate thing is, a lot of brokers and agents don't realize this that you're giving all your deals away. Yes. I probably at least given away five hundred to nine hundred million dollars worth of deals just by like giving opportunities to other people Mm -hmm. and it's insane it's like when's it going to be your turn like why are you giving your deals away it's crazy it's i was like we're talking about before the show like we had a group of 100 agents in here and out of 100 agents six of them own rental property like i think you're doing yourself a disservice and your clients a disservice if you just don't just for not understanding the investing world right yeah Yeah, and it's crazy. And and also too, like I at the time I was like, is it okay to get back in the the like the seat again? Like mm-hmm. ride the horse. Like I lost everything at such a young age, but like 
I had been recognizing and studying the patterns enough to see where the cycles were going that okay. I felt com com confident enough to actually invest. So now you got that deal. You made a nice chunk of money. Yeah. What did you do next with it? I bought more apartments. I bought okay. another Aplex and just grew it to the... Were you keeping them? Or? No, I was flipping them all. Oh, so... Because okay. I knew it was for a season. Got it. So, because you under... Uh, for the further back you understand you, history, the further you can see the future, right? Yes. So, so it was for a short season. It was a, for a period of time. So I, I really slowed down in 22. I ended up losing money on one deal. I was partnering with a couple of my other investors. Mm -hmm. It was a 53 unit in Arcadia or right off of Thomas. And one, there's a couple reasons why I walked away from this deal. One was it was worth about 14 and a half to 15 when we were buying it. And then all we had like five rate increases within a couple of weeks in like the first part of like April, May. Mm -hmm. And then all the lenders started ghosting me. Oh. That was the first time that ever happened. And then at that point, the only lender that would lend on it was um, a hard money lender. And I was like, how are you going to be able to refinance? I'm like, let's look for permanent financing. And nobody really wanted to touch it. And then I was also paying attention to the evictions. Like there was like 75. 800 or 5,500 evictions during that month like we were supposed to close. I'm like, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I chose to walk away. I didn't let my investors lose their deposit, so I was the one who lost 480000 Wow. So it was a big loss, but it just traded in June in 23 for 8.4. So I saved myself like eight point, like four and a half million. So you still held it? No, I, or, I just okay. walked away. Got it. Got but it. I would have taken a four and a half million dollar got loss. It. Yes. Got it. No, thank you. No, no. So what did you learn there? I learned that, one, I broke my own rule, which is buying majority ones and mm. a master meter building. Oh, okay. Okay. And then where Could was... Could you explain master meter for people that are... Yeah, so okay. if you buy a building that's master meter, you're responsible for all the tenants. But like I actually broke my own rule because there were some other ones that had just recently traded mm. in the same area for around the same price or actually more that were master metered and it was a better location so i felt i was going to be safer but unfortunately like the market we can't control the interest rates now everyone that's bought in the last three to four years weren't so lucky because now they're losing their buildings or having large capital calls. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to lose their deposits because everyone that were going in on these deals in the last three to four years would always go in non-refundable. The minimum would be like a hundred to, you know, $400,000 as a standard mm -hmm. to get a contract because everyone was bidding on these contracts. Wow. I mean, the interest rates were really low. And then, or people would get bridge notes where they put down 10 to 15%. Mm -hmm. And then they would refinance in 18 months to three years. But unfortunately, they caught wind of the interest rate now, like they're stuck in their deals. So what are they going to do? 60% of all the owners here in Arizona will lose their buildings. And it'll go back to the banks? Or do you They'll think... go back to the banks. Like, I'm not even, like, calling the actual owners anymore. I'm just going direct to the banks. Wow. Do you think they're going to get flooded with these? Oh, we are. And okay. there's millions of, no like, millions of units actually coming due. It's going to be the biggest transfer of wealth in the next 12 to 18 months. And do you think, are they going to be like short sales or like, what do you think? Um, gonna... Potentially, because what happened was when I walked away from that deal, the vacancy went way up. The rents have dropped over 25%. Have been dropping. Yeah. Yep. And then, and then now like the rates are like in the high sixes, high sevens. So you can't cash flow. Yeah. So to get into a deal, you need like 65% down mm. to get an actual loan. That's frustrating. And so then the sellers are still like, I want this price per unit, and they haven't come down to reality. But if you really think about it with all those buildings I flipped, I'll give you an example. I sold a fourplex in Old Town Scottsdale for 575000 a unit. <laughs> How is it? That's a price of a house. It was never worth that. Yeah. But I made it look pretty, and I put a an Airbnb tenant that was giving me $2,800 a month in rent. And I was renting it out like where they were paying for all utilities and everything. Mm. It was like almost like a triple net. There you go. Yeah. So the investor would buy it, sold that all cash within four days. Wow. I made $1.1 million off a little fourplex. Good for you. And then, you know, same thing. I bought three fourplexes together. I, was, I got that one off a mailer. The seller, I had two people under contract twice. 
You do a lot of mailers or used to do a lot of mailers. I do. I think I used to get your mailers all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, okay, because I had some stuff in Sunny Slope. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it. no. I no, that's right. I send I out 7,000 7, yeah. pieces a month. I was on your list. Yeah. So <laughs> that deal was great because, like, the people were like, oh, well, it's not cash flowing. Mm -hmm. It's a two cap. It needs too much work. I'm like, you know what? I'll just buy it. So I bought it and it made $1.3 million on that deal, almost $1.4. Wow. So, like, it was a season, right? Mm -hmm. But people didn't want to let go of that season Never, and when yeah. people were going in with institutional brokers the brokers were telling them what they wanted to hear mm -hmm. and those guys are losing big time so so never listen to the pro forma <laughs> do your own due diligence yeah and that's what i teach because mm -hmm. like um i would never i've never lost an investor money on any deal i've ever sold and a lot of people Amazing. can't say that yeah that's true. So, like, I can sleep at night knowing that I'm not harming people. So, so let's go. So, great story. A lot. I, okay. So, we went from beginning till today, almost, almost today. Yeah. So, with when you say seasons, you've been saying that a lot, right? So, yeah. so we're ending. In, we just ended one. Uh -huh. You're saying we're going into the biggest transfer of wealth. So, for our Azria members, the single family operators, the small multifamily operators, like, what do they do? Can we put together like a action plan because right like like you said who's gonna a new person that wants to call they're not gonna call the bank they're in, who do first thing they're how do you even call the bank so yeah no i that, teach that okay you do yeah, all right, all yeah right. i teach that <laughs> so, so outside of the what you teach like what's some actionable steps that newer or smaller investors can do to get into your world um number one invest in yourself okay okay and yep. what i mean by that is education mm-hmm they so can true. invest in my course, Learning Apartments. Um, I created a course to teach people how to get a deal with or without a broker. Okay. And how to protect their assets, mm -hmm. which is your, you know, yep. your rear end compared to like somebody else's. So like if the broker's not going to represent you and you don't get a broker to have representation, what are you going to do? You right. better really know what you're doing. And that's why I created this. And also, too, I want to give the little guy an opportunity to actually get a deal. Yep. Because honestly, like I can't even tell you how many duplexes I've bought in that the listing agent lists it wrong. They list it as a house and I'll buy it and I'll make like 200000 That's that's another, that's another part of agents not understanding investing. Yeah. Yes, you can or get deals like, on MLS. You know what really? Yeah. It ticks me off a little bit. People will buy Zillow leads, right? Like an agent. Mm -hmm. And then they'll call me and try to ask, ask questions and they don't have a clue what it is. I'm like... I really want to make sure that people have this course opportunity, whether they're a new investor, a new wholesaler, syndicator, or a new sales agent to at least get started properly so that way they don't harm themselves or their clients. No, it's great. I love that. I have a friend, um, he owns a lot of commercial buildings in uh -huh. central Phoenix. And uh, I was like, what would you do if you had to do it over again? He's like, you know, I'll just go back. I'll go back and buy all these little multifamilies all around town. Yeah. Like and, he, and, and he's I'm, a big commercial guy. Yeah. And he's like, I'll just buy four plexes. <laughs> you know? I know. And you know what? The reason why I'm in my niche, the two to 100 unit range trades mm -hmm. every 18 months or less, or sometimes I'll trade the same in, same deal two to three times a year. So when you say, I know what you mean with trade, but like every 18 months, what it, it's- They trade. Just- Okay, so the average homeowner sells every six to eight years. So you're saying the average multifamily sells every 18 months. Yeah, and, and sometimes two to three times in one year. Wow. That's why I love my niche. Interesting. I, I call it my bread and butter. Okay, so education. Okay, so, so they're mismanaged. They're mismanaged. Oh, a lot okay. of investors will buy out of state. Mm -hmm. They're not making a return and they want to get rid of them. Got it. Mm-hmm. Do they usually are they do do you notice they're more motivated sellers like selling at a discount or it just depends right now like a lot of sellers are kind of like have their leg in between their I mean their tail in between mm -hmm. their legs mm -hmm. and like they're not able to make like the sales or they owe too much so they're kind of like in trouble right now and they're seeing what they can do to hang on so right now it's been very difficult because like we have like what our prices are supposed to be right now. And then our sellers think they still want 21 pricing. Yeah. For Arizona, it's like a, a huge loss. This is why I expanded it into another market. So I'm recognizing the same pattern that I saw here. Got it. Five years ago in Florida. That's cool. You said, so you're in Florida doing that. Yeah. There was a, a guy in Newport. He's do multi. He came in here like in 17, 18, was just buying up a bunch of multifamily. 
And he would say he would just look for cities that are three years behind another city and just travel. And he went to Houston. Like once Phoenix started getting oversaturated, he went to Houston. Yeah. Or something so like I that. see so, the pattern recognition. I'll give oh, you an example. Cool. So instead That's of. That's a lot of work though. Like, like okay. We're yeah. jumping the gun, right? So, edu- so once again, education and s- building your skill. Yeah, because I gonna- went and got my broker's license. Me and my husband got our broker's license. We started the process in May of 23. Mm-hmm. And we just opened up our shop. We have a office. In Florida? Yeah, in Las Olas, in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we're right off of Las Olas. And now, like, I just pick up a fourplex in Fort Lauderdale. I got it for 650 I let the agent represent me. There was 15 offers on it. I had to come in pretty much non-refundable, got the deal, but I can exit for one four. Wow. So, like, well, that's a big process. So you're, we're talking, you're jumping cities now. So they got to build a team. You gotta yeah. I already have my market. sales team out there already. Okay. Got it. So like my, my agents and my people that work for me are extremely loyal. Got it. And everyone that works with works for our brokers is an investor. So got we it. do deals together. We make things happen. So, to go back to the actionable tips. So yeah. get your education. Yes. And definitely get like, I know people are like, oh, I can do this without a real estate license. Yes, you can. But you can have a lot more perks when you're licensed. Like, yeah, like what? Um, self-directed pension plan, self-directed 401k. Um, you can pay yourself a commission off your flips. Mm-hmm. And if you buy them in your self-directed 401k or self-directed pension plan, you don't have to worry about a 1031 exchange and buying into a building you don't want. Yeah. So you can really grow your retirement and also pay yourself commissions. Wow. So and I love that. And I'm, I've never been against everyone says, should I get my license or not when I'm becoming an investor? I, I know some people like really frown upon. I'm like, why? Yeah, like you this is like, you know, contract law. You know how to protect yourself. There you go. And, and it's not needed, but like the perks. No, I, said, I mean, like there's just too many perks not to not have it. You know, my, my wife and I, so she's an agent investor. So we would cold call the same list and we would have our caller call cash offer cash offer and then we would say call the same list hey want to list your house top dollar yeah she got more conversations and then those people that were truly motivated they would open up to her more because she's a licensed agent they probably, yeah I don't, so what, you're you're a professional right yeah exactly and it definitely helps but like honestly you can you have access to like so much more like subscriptions that you can't see as a wholesaler if you're not licensed so i definitely encourage it but i also teach what subscriptions you need to have to get into multifamily to get the off-market owners without having an mls subscription too can you share something can you give us a tip yeah so (laughs) the biggest tip for them is to just sign up for our course Mm -hmm. it's going to be like the biggest life-changing event for them honestly Mm -hmm. We have like a pre-launch offer right now. It's super affordable. Anybody can get into it and also has a 30-day money-back guarantee. Cool. And then I also am launching a software called Pro Underwriter. So let's talk about institutional brokers and Excel, okay? Mm-hmm. When you're an institutional broker, and this is why I don't work at the big houses, is you have to make 100 to 150 calls a day. You also have to have a finance degree typically or a degree in real estate. And Got you it. have to really know Excel. Did you know like... Out of like 150 deals of underwriting, it takes about 659 hours, and it's like you might get one. Who has time for that? So is that the the going rate? 150 deal evaluate 150 deals, maybe get one deal. Yeah. Is that where it's at? Okay. Could like how many hours is that going to take you? Yeah. Like you need a full time underwriter. Social multifamily is a little. Yeah. Who has time for yeah. that? So I like to not necessarily cut corners, but I like to save time because time is money. Mm-hmm. So I partnered up with a software company and created Pro Underwriter. And so now you can drop an Excel file. It underwrites it for you. It actually will do like the T12 parser for you. It shows all the red flags for people that are deficient, people that don't have like an actual deposit. And it actually will print out an LOI for you less than 10 minutes. So now you can write out all these LOIs to brokers or directly to the owners and not have to spend a thousand hours underwriting a freaking deal. So let's go back up a little bit on that because so you take the Excel, which is the T12, the, the right. rolls and all that, right? So trailing 12 means the performance of the last 12 months on mm-hmm. that specific property. Whereas when we talked about Proformer, for those who are listening, 
the agents try to sell you on what it can do. Right. But they don't tell you what it's been doing. Right. right. It costs and money like, to And then who's going to like point out all those things, right? Yeah. If you don't have a full-time underwriter and you're a new investor. And then, you know, what's great too is the software actually shows you what the daily rate is, like what's actually going on in the treasury. And it'll calculate what the going rate is for that day and what a loan quote will actually be. It's so incredibly helpful. So you, it also does a flood, like it actually will show it on the map if it's in a flood zone, because then you have to factor in, the, in that for insurance. So like, there's so much work to do a larger deal, but like, this is why people can't get one. It right. just takes so much work. So you need a whole entire team, you need all this stuff, but you don't have to have that necessarily anymore. That's interesting. I, I had a conversation actually at the conference we were at. It was like, it's to the point where it's just like copying and estimating repairs is always is the most important skills you need to have because you got it. You're writing the check. I, I do, teach that because yeah. a lot of people don't know how to comp a multifamily. That's yeah. a whole nother whole yeah, whole nother lot. beast. Not just based off the income approach. There's a comp approach, but I've also created comps that have never been done before because mm. you have to create a strategy and you have to create an opportunity. And right. I'm doing the same thing now in Florida. I did that here for like three like a little over almost three years but now i'm doing the same strategy there in in florida because i recognize the pattern for the exits there now too so so now with technology it's like you get just drop the information and it seems pretty it's all it's with ai too it's yeah. like who has like we have chat gpt right yeah like we have to get people to like post your stuff on social media like we don't have that time you know like we're like a instant gratification like do you really want to go through 150 deals to maybe get one it's a lot of work you still have to do it but you just got yeah. to do it fast you're saying yeah, do it fast, fast but leverage like 659 technology. hours that's a lot wow so so then you said loi letter of intent yeah, which is different prints, than single family yeah world. so like if we're doing like a five unit or above and we're directly you know dealing with an attorney on one side or a broker like we start off with like an loi letter of intent yeah or we can go right to a psa which is your purchase sale agreement depending on like who's drafted it up if it's like through an institution brokerage and normally you'll have an attorney draft up something a little bit of a larger deal so are you just pulling well i guess you're getting the the data from the owner or the broker and you're just dropping the excel file into the program yeah and, and i already do my out. own okay. diligence due diligence on the markets because like i i look at multifamily like the stock market i'm constantly like trading or watching like every single little thing or i'm watching like the like the rent drop or the growth. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> the average sales price right now in Fort Lauderdale is $352,000 a door. Mm -hmm. The vacancy is 6%. The average rent is twenty seven fifty. That's insane. Wow. Okay. And like they're still going up. Here now, like let's give a Phoenix, for example, it's a 10 to 14% vacancy. Mm -hmm. The average rent now is like, it's getting down to like twelve fifty. Okay, that's yeah. that's a big drop. I have, a, I have a one one bedroom unit. I dropped two hundred dollars already just trying to find that. Yeah, yeah. And like some people are like, oh well, I don't want to reduce the rates. Like, well, there's so much competition. Mm -hmm. We had all that new construction that's hit the market from like during COVID. Mm -hmm. Like I think downtown Phoenix is like a twenty three percent vacancy. There's so much really. Yeah, and then there's two to three months rent for free. There's approximately three hundred ninety two thousand units available for rent. Okay. Wow. Phoenix is a bit in trouble, and it's going to take us five, ten and, years to recover. And that kills the mom and pop that has these small triplexes because yeah. you, you can't compete with the luxury yoga and pool and gym with these new builds, right? Yeah. If they do, if they drop their rents and give you three months free, like yeah, you're yeah. like, oh hell, like where do I want to live? And we you have know? fifteen thousand more scheduled brand new construction units to be delivered by the end of the year. Wow, so even more on the market. Yeah. So, so you're saying you're catching Florida before they go through this. Potentially. They well, they're having an average of 4,000 people moving there a day. So some wow. people are complaining like, oh, well, you're you're kicking out the natives. And it's like I've had people talk a lot of shit on my social media about Phoenix. Oh, you're 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 the one who's not making Phoenix affordable. I'm like, dude, I am not the one. Yeah. I'm the least of your problems. Mm -hmm. You need to go look at like the bigger like REITs that are buying everything. Like with seriously. Black Stone, with Black Rock Stone, yeah. whatever it was, 40%, 44%. Yeah, like you, you got housing. bigger problems than me. Yeah. I'm sorry. So true. I'm such a small fish in this pond, mm -hmm. right? So like seriously, but people will be like, oh, well, I'm moving. Or people are like, I don't want to invest in Florida because of the ta taxes and insurance. Well, guess what? Our insurance here has doubled. 
So what's the difference? 37% last year. Yeah. it's And you know what? Like I've seen it double on yeah. a lot of people's stuff mm-hmm. right now. And even for my own, I'm like, why the hell am I paying this? I'm like, we don't have like earthquakes, like very rarely, tornadoes. We don't have like a giant ocean of like a tsunami or any yeah. of that stuff. But like, I think it's just a national thing. I think they're trying to like push people. I think they're trying to push the middle class out. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, doesn't want to go down a whole nother world. Yeah. I went, <laughs> I actually, I did a podcast yeah. yesterday with a management company, Rosenbaum. They're down in Gilbert, but she says it's a blue state now. I'm like, what do you mean? It's a blue state. She's like, when we evict a tenant, even though our rights here in Arizona have always been very red, like we can get rid of them quickly she says now they're letting the tenants stay it's there's 24 anti-landlord bills being proposed in arizona so yeah uh, mark zimmon i'm sure you're familiar with mark uh top eviction attorney yeah if we don't vote right or if you're a landlord vote where you want to vote but if i don't even think our votes really count anymore it, ever it, since it, like everything's yeah. went down um but yeah like i i don't like what arizona's turned into like i live out in north scottsdale Mm -hmm. when like the barrett jackson was going on and like the phoenix open was going on they had a sting operation they arrested 155 pedophiles that were trying to sex traffic children wow this is in north scottsdale like i don't feel safe wow interesting. like i don't feel safe here at all like and they are getting away with it and our borders are open so like Mm -hmm. we have like bigger problems than people realize in my opinion yeah so so we Sorry, go yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. let's get back to multifamily <laughs> but, um, but off here yes we'll keep going so multifamily you're in florida so another thing i want to talk about is 2019 to early 2024 like i heard you were like seven unit eight unit 53 unit then you know, all these big numbers mm-hmm. what can you share with someone that's just like so there's always these levels, right? To all, no matter how successful you are, right? From beginning to whatever, we're always trying to break a barrier. So yeah. like, w- that's fast. That's yeah. impressive. So like, what what are some things? I think with- everyone that is looking to buy a house right now, definitely either buy a single family, mm-hmm. rent out your rooms, do the house hack or the pad split, or get into multifamily in a different market, do the FHA, or now, since like November of 23, they passed a 5% down on a duplex to a fourplex. So that means that you can get a loan up to 1.55. Like it's a lot of money to get a little apartment. 5% down. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And then if you're licensed, you can use your commission as a down payment, get the seller to actually pay for your closing costs. You almost come in with no money. Yeah, and and going to, going back, into the politic thing yeah <laughs> but moving out the middle class buy a house right like yeah. usually in when you started and i started it was like um is the market going up is it going down i'm gonna wait whatever yeah. it is now it's a different it's totally world. different like but, i but, i'll give you an example i i remember buying my house in 18 one of my houses that me and my husband mm-hmm. wanted to start a new family we got married but the house at the time was 642 i thought that was so much money back then like 642000 and it needed a ton of work. And yeah, I even canceled the contract. I'm like, I don't want to spend this type of money on a house. Yeah. Like I, you know. Now there's no houses. I know. And it's like, in over time, real estate is great, right? Time heals real estate. So it's like, I have my house, my mortgage payment is 1300 bucks. Oh, yeah. Right? In Central Phoenix, right? So like, that's what I'm saying. Like, so when kids are can't afford a house now or can't get into an opportunity now you're actually like for your kids if you buy houses now yeah your kids won't be struggling in the future like trying to get their own house it may be something you pass down because rent's going to be crazy oh houses are going to be unaffordable so you got to think like yeah so so what i i actually i bought that house in 18 Mm -hmm. with all my apartment flips i renovated it i put a couple hundred thousand in and i sold it in i sold it in 22 Mm-hmm. yeah 20 no i'm sorry i sold it in 23 cool. i sold it in april of 23 i sold it for 1.545 so nice and it was like a really good spread so people are like oh the mortgage rates are so high i mean i walked away from a 2.4 percent rate my pain yeah. was 2400 yeah i mean i'm paying taxes for that just in my town home up in north scottsdale that's just, like i'm sorry like my wow. taxes my insurance that a month yeah. without a mortgage so like like, honestly, like, yeah. time is money. I used to drive, like, an hour and a half away for hockey practice a day to go to North Scottsdale. I'm like, I can't do this drive anymore. Yeah. Like, it comes to a point, like, 
like three hours a day is not worth my time for a lower payment. Sorry. Yeah. So interesting. So we got get educated. Yeah. Buy your course. Yeah. And um, get the buy, software. Get the software. software really because that can get you started really quickly. And people don't realize this. And people are like, "Well, oh, I don't have the money, or I don't have this." If you find the deal, the money will come. And I know you know this, mm-hmm. right? Oh yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. If you find a deal and you're able to tie it up, oh my God, the money will come. Yeah, like you can't see it on here, but like one of our trainings here is Deal Finders Club. Like yeah. I tell everyone, flippers, ages, whatever it is, like you got to have that skill of a wholesaler, right? Going yeah. direct off market. Can't beat that because if you're not liking what the market's bringing, the deal is still a whole, I just got a deal from a wholesaler in Miami. I just, I'm tying it up today, actually. It was a duplex in Miami that's just sold in October of 23. For seven fifty, and it's beautiful. It's remodeled, and now like somehow the wholesaler got him, got him to accept a contract at five eighty. I'm like, are they stupid? You got to Do they not shopping. know the market? I mean, like I'll make a hundred fifty thousand dollars spread in like thirty days. That's amazing. You got to shop for deal. It doesn't yeah, but the wholesaler doesn't. Shop. Like I, I don't yeah. understand why the wholesaler is not buying the deal themselves, closing it, and then putting it on the market. They don't either. They don't know what they're, they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, they're scared to do it, whatever yeah. it may be. But that's where the opportunity lies. He found an opportunity from the homeowner. You're finding opportunity from him. Everyone wins down the road. So Yeah. But know. like eventually you gotta stop giving your deals away. You, True. You gotta get on that like saddle, ride mm-hmm. it, and make sure that you can actually make something happen for a legacy for yourself and your family. So as we re- wind down here, are you gonna start buying more or you're gonna keep flipping? I'm definitely going to buy more. If I was to hold something, I would want to go on a much larger deal. Okay. Yeah. Where I have, awesome. like, I love, like, these quick deals with multifamily. They're very hard to cash flow. These smaller apartments are almost impossible for the price that we're buying them at to cash flow. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're just flipping them to the people that. Yeah. So okay. if I can make a three to 500% return, I'll do that because, it, like, how long is it going to take me to make that off of the cash flow? True. Sorry, I can't do that. Yeah, I get it. All right, so how do we find you? How do we get a hold of you? How do What do we do? GraceSiri.com is our brokerage if you mm-hmm. need help buying or selling real estate. And then LearningApartments.com is our website. Mm-hmm. And then I'm on social media. I'm on YouTube, Facebook, Sophia Willits, W-I-L-L-E-T-S. And Sophia spelt with a P-H. Cool. <laughs> And then I'm on um, Instagram, TikTok, and all that. Sophia APTS for apartments. Thanks for listening to the Azria Show with your hosts, Marcus Maloney and Mike Delpreet. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you found this information valuable, head over to azria.org and learn more about our community.